good morning. And uh, thank you all very much for being here today. Today's hearing will focus on the aftermath of the landmark Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, both within the Bush administration and within Congress. In 1998, in response to an inquiry by then Representative Tom DeLay, the Clinton administration's Environmental Protection Agency said that it believed that the Clean Air Act provided it with the authority to regulate carbon dioxide. One year later, a group of environmental and other advocacy organizations petitioned the EPA to use this authority to set greenhouse gas standards for cars. But it wasn't until 2003, when the Bush administration had already embarked on a course of denial, delay and dismissal of the risk of climate change and the need to address it, that the EPA repudiated the Clinton administration's conclusion that carbon dioxide was a pollutant that could be regulated and denied the petition. That petition became the case known as Massachusetts versus EPA. Until April of this year, <clears throat> the Bush administration continued to assert that it lacked authority to regulate carbon dioxide. It continued to assert that the science was uncertain, that voluntary programs to reduce emissions would be sufficient, and that rhetorical policy goals should take the place of binding regulatory language. It continued to fight the states who were pushing to move ahead. But all that changed when the Supreme Court ruled that under the plain meaning of the Clean Air Act, carbon dioxide is a pollutant, and that EPA could not hide behind its smokescreen any longer. In fact, under the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Clean Air Act, EPA now has the duty to regulate as long as it determines that emissions of carbon dioxide endanger public health and welfare. Nevertheless, the President has issued a new executive order that effectively said, start studying this problem and try to finish it up right before I leave office. Six and a half years into his administration, after the scientific consensus on the dangers of climate change has become overwhelming, after we hear that the Earth has warmed so much that transportation routes in Greenland that used to require dog sleds in the winter now can be traveled by boat, the President sees no urgency and is engaged in a stall. Instead of moving to regulate against the threat of global warming, he has decided that his Cabinet is to spend the remainder of his term talking about it. And the signs that this issue isn't being taken seriously enough by this administration doesn't end there. Just last week, the head of NASA said that he wasn't sure if global warming was a problem that we needed to wrestle with. At this week's G8 meeting, the President indicated that all he is willing to do is engage in fruitless discussions on the nature of non-binding goals until the very end of his administration leaving his successor with the task of actually doing something. I hope that our executive branch witnesses will be able to shed some light on the nature and stringency of the proposal they are working on. But as the EPA and NHTSA lace up their shoes and start to head over to the starting blocks, 12 states are already sprinting to the finish line as they have already promulgated regulations that reduce emissions from cars. They have already concluded that the science is unequivocal. The risk is real and the solutions within our grasp. Under the circumstances, it would be helpful to the planet if our regulatory agencies would simply stop being obstacles to other actors. If EPA would grant California's request to act, other states could act as well. I hope that Mr. Johnson will be able to shed some light on the schedule for the approval process. I expect some of our witnesses have also taken note of the emergence of a legislative attempt to block EPA from acting. 
the discussion draft pending in the Energy and Commerce Committee, for example, would have the effect of overturning Massachusetts versus EPA. Specifically, that legislation would remove EPA's authority to set greenhouse gas standards for cars and preempt states' rights to by requiring EPA to deny California's request to move forward with its own greenhouse gas program. In its place, that bill proposes anemic fuel economy standards and opens the door to allow fuel made from dirty coal into our transportation fuel supply. The legislation fails to meet the test established by Speaker Pelosi earlier this year that any legislation we approve must both address America's energy dependency without increasing the threat of global warming and address the threat of global warming without increasing our energy dependency. So we have a moral obligation uh, to ensure that we reduce our dangerous dependency on imported oil from the Middle East by making our cars and our trucks much more efficient. And we must meet that challenge posed as well by global warming. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, both from the Bush administration and its response to the Supreme Court decision, and to Congress's pending plans to reject uh, that decision altogether, uh, and from the states, uh, which will be represented uh, here as well. Uh, that concludes the opening statement of the Chair. I now turn to recognize the uh, gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I deeply appreciate your convening this hearing this morning. Uh, as you have noted, uh, given the um, draft that is circulated out of the Commerce Committee underscores some of the, the problems still at work here on Congress. And you and I, uh, along with Mr. Uh, Cleaver, uh, Ms. Herseth, uh, had an opportunity this last week, uh, starting in Greenland, but going across uh, Europe, dealing with uh, uh, leaders, true leaders, in coping with the problem of global warming, uh, underscoring the gap between uh, the foot dragging here through EPA for the last six years, aided and abetted by forces in Congress that are still in <coughs> denial. Um, it is critical that we have this conversation today, and I, I do deeply appreciate, I applaud your leadership, that of our speaker, who has made it clear uh, that she, for one, uh, has a much different view. Uh, the gap between the science, between what is happening uh, with foreign countries where the United States torpedoed uh, an opportunity to, to have real progress just this week, uh, to what we are seeing uh, the lack of action by EPA for years is forcing at the local and state level initiatives. My state of Oregon is one that has joined with California in trying to deal meaningfully. We have 522 cities and hundreds of college campuses that have said, we are not waiting, we are going to move forward. Uh, but the, the mindset that we are seeing from the administration and some uh, forces in Congress, if we are not uh, equal to the challenge are going to set us further behind, and a world that looks to the United States for leadership will continue to be perplexed and disappointed. Uh, I am hopeful that we will be able to bring into tighter focus <coughs> these issues as a result of the hearing that you have scheduled here today. Look forward to hearing from our witnesses, particularly the people who are fighting for the right for states to move forward to uh, step in where the Federal Government has been unable and refused. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for an opening statement. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I will have a very uh, short statement. I, too, would like to express appreciation to you and Speaker Pelosi for uh, the visionary move uh, that allowed us to uh, see firsthand uh, in uh, Greenland, uh, what is transpiring uh, on this small ball uh, revolving around the, the sun we call Earth, and it is truly alarming. And as I have 
I said uh, many times uh, recently, uh, time is not on our side. Uh, on the front page of yesterday's Washington Post, which I'm sure uh, the uh, witnesses have seen, there's a photograph uh, of a bay in uh, Greenland. Uh, we were in this spot uh, about uh, seven and a half days ago. And we had the opportunity to speak with Greenlanders who are not scientists, they're not Republicans or Democrats, they're not policy wonks, they're not uh, trying to get uh, any uh, pushback on uh, global warming. They are <coughs> residents. Just a few of the 53,000 people who live there, and they are very clear. Their lives have changed. Global warming is real. Places where they used to slay it, uh, now they fish. And when you look at this bay and see the blue and listen to the natives tell you that this is not supposed to be blue at this time of the year, it never has been, it is chilling. And then let me just conclude by saying <clears throat> it was terribly embarrassing to meet with legislators from other nations and to hear them say that they've spoken with uh, people in this government uh, who are still denying the science of global warming. It is my hope, it is at this point my prayer uh, that we will have a revolution in the way we think about this issue and begin to join uh, the uh, 21st century. Uh, I look forward to uh, raising some uh, questions with you uh, during that period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Uh, it's clear that we've had states really showing some vision across the country to move to defeat this scourge of global warming. And I think the state's message should be to the federal government, the, that old saying, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And frankly, this administration has not led, has not followed, and has not got out, got out of the way. And we are determined to have a federal government that will lead, much less not get out of the way. And the reason is, is that states historically have helped lead the country forward. You think about women's suffrage, it was Wyoming first in 1869 that moved forward, followed by Colorado. And these states, including California and my state and Oregon and six others, have helped lead this country to a new energy future. And we are determined in the next several weeks to have the federal government lead uh, to uh, show some leadership finally. I was in uh, Europe with the uh, uh, talking to other members and other governments last week with an energy subcommittee and was asked to uh, respond to Prime Minister Tony Blair as he spoke to an interparliamentarian group in Berlin. And I had an exchange with the Prime Minister. Basically, uh, uh, I was presenting the, the case that the President's view that we can fight global warming with voluntarism is just doomed to failure. You know, you can run a bake sale based on voluntary activity. You cannot run a war on global warming. It's sort of like the president wants to write little frilly letters to the oil company and said, would you, would you fellas just stop polluting the planet and expecting them to respond? That's like expecting consumers to just volunteer to pay at the pump. The voluntary system is not going to work here. And I asked the prime minister what he thought the best argument was to try to get the White House and this administration to finally understand why we needed binding commitments, why we needed cap and trade system, why we needed a renewable portfolio standard. And I thought his answer was instructive. He said, it is clear we need new technologies. And to get new technologies, we need to drive investment into those new technologies. And to drive investment in those new technologies, we need binding commitments to tell the investors that they should move to clean energy future. And I thought that was the right answer for the world and it's the right answer for America. And I look forward to the next few, a few weeks getting the federal government to finally show some leadership. Thank you. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, uh, Ms. Uh, Herseth Sandlin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Markey. I want to thank you for having this hearing and I want to thank our witnesses. Administrator Johnson was in South Dakota just a couple of years ago, shortly after we passed the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which uh, I supported. 
uh, primarily because of the renewable fuel standard that we had for the first time uh, that many of us from Midwestern Great Plains states had advocated uh, for years and finally were able to get, although we didn't get it quite at the level that we would have liked, uh, I know that the administrator was taking steps at that time to uh, look at the regulations necessary as it related to the production process uh, in meeting the 7.5 billion gallon renewable fuel standard of which we will surpass uh, based on current projections by the end of this year, uh, which I appreciate the opportunity this morning to explore further with our uh, witnesses uh, and with members of the committee the President's 35 billion gallon uh, renewable I wish it were renewable fuel standard requirement. I think the language is alternative fuel standard. Uh, and so I look forward to exploring the issue there as I have done uh, with others at the White House with regard to renewable fuels versus alternative fuels and the importance of addressing um, a greenhouse gas reduction policy federally uh, that helps lead the way internationally as so many of our discussions on the recent congressional delegation trip to Europe uh, identified. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the hearing uh, and I yield back. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, all time for opening statements by members has uh, we will now turn to our, our panel. Mr. Chairman, uh, may I just inquire? I am glad to. I, I, I do not see any of our Republican <coughs> colleagues here. Uh, was there any statement that was submitted to the record that would help us clarify um, any of their positions or concerns about the nature and extent of the hearing today? Um, I would have to, if the gentleman would allow me to uh, inquire of the minority if there are any statements. But to be fair, um, today was a day that the Congress was supposed to be in session. The Congress has now decided that it will not meet today. And so I think uh, many of the Republicans have returned to their home districts as of last night and this morning. And I think that is something that note in fairness. Um, if there are any statements that the minority will include it in the record, but I think that's something that uh, has to be noted in fairness. Let me turn to uh, uh, now recognize uh, Stephen Johnson. Stephen Johnson was sworn in as the 11th Administrator of the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency just over two years ago after 26 years at the EPA. Prior to becoming administrator, he held several senior level positions, including acting administrator, deputy administrator, and held several other uh, senior level positions, including acting uh, uh, administrator, uh, including uh, assistant administrator uh, uh, and Positions. So we welcome you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Could you put on the microphone down there if you <clears throat> Sorry. There we go. Okay, We're on now. Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay. You. Again, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about climate change and energy security. As you know, in Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court made several findings regarding EPA's denial of a petition to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new motor vehicles under the Clean Air Act. EPA is moving forward to meet the Supreme Court's decision in a thoughtful, deliberative manner, considering every appropriate option and every appropriate tool at our disposal. In that context, on May the 15th, President Bush directed EPA and the Departments of Energy, Transportation, and Agriculture to coordinate our efforts in taking the first regulatory step to address greenhouse gas emissions from cars. The President called on us to base our work on his 2010 plan, which would reduce U.S. gasoline consumption by 20 percent over the next 10 years. This announcement both represents and responds to the Supreme Court's recent ruling and provides a path forward for improving our energy security by reducing U.S. dependence on oil. Additionally, in keeping with EPA's commitment to address the Court's ruling ex expeditiously and responsibly, we sign the formal notice that starts the public process for considering the California waiver petition. We recently held two widely attended public hearings 
and the public comment period remains open until June the 15th. As we continue our aggressive yet practical strategy to cut our domestic carbon footprint, the President also understands that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a global challenge. And on May 31st, the President offered a global strategy. Last week, the President called upon the world's 15 largest emitters to set a global goal on a long-term greenhouse gas reduction. The President proposed to convene a series of meetings with other countries, including rapidly growing economies like India and China, to establish a new framework for the post-2012 world. Under the framework, each country would establish midterm national targets and programs that reflect their own current and future energy needs. The President believes that by encouraging and sharing cutting-edge technologies, major emitters can meet realistic reduction goals. Both domestically and internationally, this, this administration is addressing the serious challenge of global climate change. As you all know, in 2002, President Bush committed to cut U.S. greenhouse gas intensity by 18 percent through the year 2012, a goal that we're on track to meet and even possibly exceed. According to the EPA data reported to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, U.S. greenhouse gas intensity declined by 1.9% in 2003, 2.4% in 2004, and 2004% in 2005. Put another way, from 2004 to 2005, the U.S. economy increased by 3.2%, while greenhouse gas emissions increased by only 0.8%. Under the President's leadership, we are seeing real results. According to the International Energy Agency, from 2000 to 2004, U.S. emissions of carbon dioxide from fuel consumption grew by 1.7 percent, while our economy expanded by nearly 10 percent. The U.S. had a lower percentage increase than Japan, Canada, the original 15 countries of the European Union, India, or China. And in fact, only two of the original EU 15 countries in the Kyoto Protocol are on schedule to meet their Kyoto targets. Over the last six years, the Bush, Bush administration has invested more than any other nation in the world, $37 billion, in a comprehensive climate change agenda. EPA climate programs include a wide array of domestic and international partnerships, which rely on voluntary measures to reduce greenhouse gas intensity, spur new investments, and remove barriers to the introduction of clean technologies. I would be happy to speak in greater detail about EPA's many climate partnership programs. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. And before I take questions, I would ask that my full written statement be submitted for the record. Uh, without objection, it thank will you, be Chairman. included um, in the record. Our um, <clears throat> other very distinguished uh, witness on um, the first panel is Nicole Nason. Uh, who began her duties as Administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration just over a year ago after serving as the Assistant Secretary for Governmental Affairs in the Department of Transportation since July of 2003. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, have you ready? Uh, please begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, since the administrator spoke about 20 and 10, in the interest of time, I thought I'd confine my remarks to CAFE this morning and, and that piece of the President's proposal. A key component of the 20 and 10 plan that the President has proposed is to significantly boost fuel economy for cars and for light trucks. The President's goal to raise fuel efficiency would save 8.5 billion gallons of gasoline annually in 2017. Towards that end, the administration forwarded legislation to Congress to grant the Secretary of Transportation the authority to reform CAFE for passenger cars in February. The Bush administration has a proven record in this area. We have raised CAFE standards for light trucks for seven consecutive years from 2005 to 2011. These higher standards are expected to save 14 billion gallons of fuel and result in a net reduction in carbon dioxide emissions of 107 million metric tons. As important, the attribute-based CAFE structure that we established promises fuel economy benefits without jeopardizing safety or causing job loss or sacrificing consumer choice. Basing our reforms 
on CAFE, on the National Academy of Sciences, we structured the CAFE program to make it more effective and safer and fairer. And we accomplished this by using a structure that incentivizes manufacturers to add fuel-saving technologies instead of downsizing vehicles. The reform has a number of benefits. First, we believe it will result in more fuel savings than under the old CAFE because now all automakers will have to make their vehicles more fuel efficient. Second, the reform has the benefit of preserving consumer choice. Under the old CAFE program, an automaker generally, generally manufactures a certain quantity of smaller vehicles to balance out the larger vehicles that they have been selling. Our attribute-based CAFE standard benefits new vehicle buyers by having all size vehicles, small, medium, and large, become more fuel efficient. We also tackled what the NAS called the safety penalty. The National Academy of Sciences estimated that CAFE was partially responsible for between 1,300 and 2,600 lives lost in one year alone. They looked at 1993. Our restructuring of CAFE incentivizes automakers to add fuel-saving technologies instead of downsizing the vehicles, and we believe we are able to minimize the safety impact. Mr. Chairman, our effort to reform CAFE will guide the way in meeting our next challenge. As you know, as the Administrator just spoke, the President has directed the Departments of Transportation and EPA, Agriculture and Energy to take steps towards regulations that would cut gasoline consumption and thus reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The steps called for in the executive order will proceed in a manner consistent with sound science, analysis of benefits and costs, safety and economic growth. It is a complicated legal and technical matter. It will take us some time to resolve, but the President has directed us to complete this regulatory process by the end of 2008. We have receive most of the manufacturers' product plans for cars, and we expect to receive their plans for light trucks shortly. Mr. Chairman, given the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Clean Air Act, there are now, in effect, two agencies with authority to regulate motor vehicle fuel economy and carbon dioxide tailpipe emissions. And as the President stated, our regulatory efforts are not a substitute for effective legislation. Accordingly, we continue to ask the Congress to enact the President's 20 and 10 proposal as the most responsible way to raise fuel economy standards, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and cut greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering your questions. Um, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, now we will uh, turn to uh, questions from the Select uh, Committee. The Chair will recognize himself, Mr. Johnson. Uh, during the May 14th press conference on the President's executive order, you quoted Justice Scalia's dissenting view in the case of Massachusetts versus uh, EPA, uh, where you said that, uh, where it said that if you were to determine that there is endangerment associated with carbon dioxide emissions, only then would EPA be required to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles? Do you believe that emissions of carbon dioxide from motor vehicles endanger public health or welfare, Mr. Johnson? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we believe that uh, greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change is a serious issue. And as we prepare and draft our proposed regulation for addressing greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, uh, we will be addressing the issue of endangerment. It's a, it's a process that we have been following since 1990. So you've been following it since 1990, but you have yet to reach a conclusion as to whether or not CO2 does, in fact, endanger the public Health or let welfare? Me, let me be clear. The process of, of addressing the issue of endangerment on air pollutants we include as part of our proposed <coughs> regulation, and that is what I was referring to since 1990. The issue of global climate change, as you probably are well aware, uh, having read the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, is an issue that goes back to the late 70s, in fact, uh, 1978. 
Uh, the Supreme Court does an excellent job of going through the, uh, the rather lengthy history uh, of, of the issue of uh, global climate change, and they, uh, they go back to 1978. Um, actually, it even goes back before that. I think they just <laughs> picked an arbitrary date. But the question is to you, Mr. Johnson, um, <clears throat> whether or not you agree with now the overwhelming consensus of science globally uh, that there is an endangerment to the public health and welfare uh, that is being caused by uh, emittance of CO2 into the atmosphere. That is squarely on your shoulders. And, um, and your answer to that question, of course, is the central question here today. Is it an endangerment to the public health and welfare of our country? And, well, the, and the world um, that CO2 is, is being emitted into the atmosphere. Global climate change is a very serious issue, and the issue of endangerment under the Clean Air Act, particularly under Section uh, 202 and 211, uh, have to be taken into consideration as part of our uh, regulatory determination. Is it a danger, Mr. Johnson? Uh, is CO2 a danger to the American people, in your opinion? Mr. Chairman, uh, global climate change is a very serious issue. Is it, a very is it a danger to the American people, Mr. Johnson, that CO2 in massive quantities is being emitted into the atmosphere? We will be laying out our position on endangerment as part of our proposed regulation. It is really difficult to believe, Mr. Johnson, <clears throat> that you, as the environmental minister for the United States, uh, as the chief protector of the environment for the United States, have yet to come to a conclusion as to whether or not CO2 is, in fact, a danger to our people and to the people of the world. You are the last major environmental minister uh, in the uh, Western world that has come to uh, a decision on this. And we should be the scientific leader, not the laggard. Uh, and to the extent to which you are still deliberating uh, allows for this danger to build as an even greater threat to uh, our people and to the entire world. Well, Mr. Chairman, the issue of endangerment is a legal term of art, as you know, that is embodied in the Clean Air Act. And as the agency has been practicing since 1990, that its position on endangerment on an air pollutant is included as part of its proposed rulemaking. My note to you again is we recognize that global warming and, and greenhouse gas emissions is a serious issue and that we are addressing it through drafting regulations for controlling it through uh, for new automobiles. And the issue of endangerment will be part of our proposed regulation. I understand what you are saying, Mr. Johnson, but your testimony is just further evidence that the Bush administration is out of step with the science uh, and with the world uh, on this issue of whether or not CO2 endangers uh, our planet and the people in our country. And I think that, uh, that uh, we are at a critical juncture at this point. It was not helpful that the White House uh, last week, in anticipation of the uh, G8 summit, said that the Bush administration's goals were aspirational for dealing with greenhouse gases. Uh, the White House, the Bush administration's goals are not aspirational. They are procrastinational. Uh, they want to delay uh, dealing with this issue. They have moved now from a policy of denial that there is a problem to delay in dealing with it. And the very fact that you are not answering this question of endangerment is just further evidence of that. Mr. Chairman, it would be irresponsible of me to make a final determination from a regulatory perspective under the Clean Air Act without having an opportunity to propose, go through notice and comment, and then make a final decision. 
Uh, I'm abiding by what the law uh, directs me to do, and that is to go through a public notice and comment process. Oh, by the way, I think that's good government. And if you look at the schedule, in my 26-year history as a government employee, to write a major regulation, generally, in my experience, takes 18 to 24 months. This well, is a very complex <clears throat> regulation, and what the President has directed us to do is to write a regulation and have it final by the end of 2008. That right. is a very aggressive, yet we believe a practical strategy for addressing it. Well, uh, I think that you and I are going to disagree on that. In fact, uh, I just have to take note at this point that neither you nor your predecessors appeared for six years before the lead environmental committee in the House of Representatives. Uh, and that is in and of itself a statement of the relationship that existed between the Bush administration and the Republican Congress. I mean, never before has there been such a successful witness protection program ever built that the EPA administrator did not for six years have to appear before the lead environmental committee in the House. And, and this um, a continued policy of delay here is something that uh, follows on that path. Let me ask just one other question, and that goes to my uh, home state and its um, successful case, Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, and the decision which was rendered by the Supreme Court. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, uh, before the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, there is uh, now a language which actually removes the authority which the Supreme Court uh, confirmed that you had, that the EPA had, uh, to regulate uh, CO2 by actually prohibiting EPA from setting national vehicle tailpipe uh, standards. Uh, do you uh, support language which would remove from you the authority to be able to deal with uh, vehicle tailpipe standards? We have uh, taken, Mr. Chairman, we have taken no position on the legislation, but as uh, my colleague from NHTSA pointed out, uh, we prefer a uh, legislative fix and certainly prefer the President's 20 and 10 uh, legislative proposal uh, because it, it, it uh, provides, uh, it is less subject to litigation, uh, it also provides uh, certainty, and it also helps to uh, prevent uh, future delay. So you have no position on legislation removing authority from your agency? We have not taken any position on that legislation. Okay. Uh, and final question, it also forces you to deny the State of California's waiver request to implement its own vehicle greenhouse gas standards. Do you support these provisions that remove your agency's authorities? Again, we have taken no position on the legislation. Uh, the California petition we are reviewing expeditiously <clears throat> and yet responsibly. The public comment period is still open. It closes on June the 15th, uh, and that is uh, the status of where we are at on the California petition. And when are you going to rule on that? I have not made a determination of the date. Um, actually, it, it is quite shocking that the lead environmental agency in the United States is, does not have a view on the defense of its own authority uh, to protect uh, the environment as legislation moving through the Congress. It is just something I think at this time in our country very disturbing to the American people. The actual state of debate uh, within the Bush administration and between Congress. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, is it the intensity of greenhouse gases or the greenhouse gases that are providing the pollution that concern us about global warming? Uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions are what are concerning us about uh, global warming. Thank you. You cited uh, statistics uh, this last year. It was only eight-tenths of a percent, I believe, that uh, emissions, 1.7 uh, percent increase in transportation. Uh, at these rates, how, how many centuries will it take any of the other developed economies to catch up with the United States, to exceed us? 
What, uh, sir, what I do know is that uh, by analysis that the agency has done, approximately by the year 2015, the developing nations, such no, as India no, and China, I'm not talking about will, any, exceed, my specific will exceed question, greenhouse gas emissions My specific from, question was what you cited and referenced developed countries, not China, which, which uses a fraction uh, three metric tons per person as opposed to our 19 metric tons. We also for have 1.3 billion absolutely, people. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. What, how many centuries would it take a developed, any of the developed economies to pass us at this rate? I don't know the answer to that. Would you calculate that just to give us a sense of perspective? How many centuries? Okay. Don't need to know how many years, just how many centuries. The, is there any other developed country other than China that is taken this laissez-faire approach that you are defending for the Bush administration? Is there any other developed country that has an approach similar to what uh, you are advocating here today? First of all, I have to disagree with your I'm not asking, uh, characterization. I'm not to debate that. I, uh. <laughs> I want to know if there's any other country that has a similar laissez-faire approach. Again, I beg to disagree with your characterization. And in fact, as a nation, we are, in fact, the world's leader. We have spent $37 billion on advancing science and technology. That's Mr. more than any Mr. other Johnson, nation in the world. We, that is, I'm asking specifically, and, and you can't have a straight face and look at on a per capita basis, on a percentage basis, what other countries are doing in terms of, we are the largest economy in the world. We're the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. We have put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than any other country in the world. Uh, the, the comparison you're giving is, uh, is beside the point. My question is, is there any other developed country that has a similar approach that you're advocating? What I, can, what I do know is that uh, the countries that are certainly part of the Kyoto Protocol, there's only two that are meeting their targets. The others are not. For example, My uh, question, so your answer is you don't know. I, you don't know, you can't well, name a single country of a developed country that is approaching this is what your answer is. You what can't I'm, give an what answer. I'm, what I'm citing is. Can you report is, back to us with an answer of any country that would, is embracing a similar approach? I would be happy to uh, I would, report I back would, to you. I would very much appreciate okay. that. Um, you know, I, I had some other questions, but the one that just, just overwhelms me at this point, you, you've spent 27 years in the EPA? 26. 26. Do you have any concerns about the morale, the credibility, the capability of that agency as a result of the leadership that you are providing now, the testimony you are providing now, the approach that is being advocated by this administration, does it, do you have any concern about its future credibility, the employee morale, the ability to, to be able to be up to the environmental tasks? Sir, I'm very proud of the outstanding employees and the work that the Environmental Protection Agency this... has done and continues to do. Uh, in fact, uh, for example, our Energy Star program that we and the Department of Energy uh, uh, administer last year in 2006, citizens of the United States saved almost $14 billion in energy costs while saving greenhouse gas equivalents to 25 million automobiles. That's the number of automobiles in the state of California and Illinois combined. That's a program. Our Smart, SmartWise program dealing with, uh, with trucks and others, 550 companies have signed up and we have significant savings in greenhouse gas emissions course, from that. That was not my question. Methane to market. Well, your question My question was, is, do you have any concern with the, with the testimony you're giving, with the foot dragging from EPA, with our being out of step with the rest of the world, do you have any concern about what that does for the morale, the professionalism, and the credibility of EPA? Not a few projects <coughs> here or there that pale 
by comparison with what you can do down the street? Go to the Norwegian embassy, go to <laughs> Denmark in terms of, do you have any concerns about what impact this has on the functioning of EPA? Well, sir, I think we have a very aggressive and yet practical strategy for addressing climate change that's delivering real results. And also like to point out that EPA, and in, in the independent survey is, is, uh, was noted this year as being one of the top 10 best places to work in the federal government. And that's a fact I'm very proud of, and we're continuing along that way. They say more about the Bush administration than EPA, <laughs> but thank you very much. All right, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to get into an argument about whether the United States is uh, the headlight or the taillight uh, with regard to uh, dealing with this problem of, of climate change. I, I think people around the world already have pretty much answered that, that, that question. Uh, but during the Supreme Court case, the, the EPA uh, argued that if uh, it were granted the authority to regulate greenhouse gases under the CAA, it would be unwise, quote, unwise to do so at this time. The EPA, uh, EPA made the claims that doing so could conflict uh, with the current administration's efforts to address climate change, particularly uh, concerning international climate negotiations. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, in your opinion, why would the EPA consider coordination by the EPA uh, with the President's climate change initiative to be potentially conflictive? Well, well, sir, one is that uh, we certainly and I ex certainly accept the uh, Supreme Court's decision that uh, CO2 is a pollutant and that we are moving forward with uh, regulating uh, CO2 uh, from new automobiles under the Clean Air Act. Uh, this is, the Court's decision is very complex. Uh, we are moving forward in an expeditious but responsible way for addressing greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles. Uh, and certainly we're considering uh, the impact on other uh, sources, such as stationary sources. Uh, you know, I have so many questions that, I, that, that it's difficult to, to, to follow up because I, 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 I need to ask you so, so many questions. I'm, I'm frankly confused about this and, 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 as I mentioned earlier, a little embarrassed because we seem to be behind the rest of the world. Um, can you just explain? quickly give your opinion as to why the 27 nations of the EU um, are already moving and in many instances moving legislatively to deal with this this issue and we are not. I mean, how much time do you think we have um, to, 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 to begin to address this issue uh, and, and if you, well, answer the, those first place. Well, first of all, I, uh, I believe the U.S. is a global leader in dealing with uh, global climate change. Do you think fact, anybody else in the world believes that? Well, and I, I believe, uh, uh, I certainly believe that at the, the uh, very pleased that uh, we reached an agreement uh, at the G8 uh, and that uh, it has been agreed that there will be a process for rapidly developing a new comprehensive post-2012 agreement. There's agreement to establish a long-term global glo goal to substantially reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And there was agreement that each nation should be the ones deciding on how's the best way to achieve that. And as I said, we have a very aggressive plan in the United States. We're beginning to write regulations to control greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. Okay, we have a the, number of partnership programs that are you. delivering real results, uh, and we're making progress. Thank you. Uh, I'm frustrated, I, I, and, and I'm frustrated only because, you know, I would, I'd like to have a candid exchange, and, um, and I'm, I'm not sure that, that this is happening. Uh, on, on March 13th of, of this year, uh, a draft bill uh, aimed at moving the United Kingdom to a low-carbon economy was introduced. And without exception, the MPs that we met with last week all indicated that it was going to be approved. 
uh, and in the measure, uh, 60, they set a 60 percent goal. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the measure would require a mandatory 60 percent cut in the UK's uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2050 compared to the 1990 levels. And so when I see uh, nations moving ahead like that, I, I'm having difficulty trying to conclude that we are the world leader. And we won't even admit that there is global warming. Do you admit it? Uh, which, do you con concur that there is, in fact, global warming? Yes, as I said, in fact, the President has said ten, since 2001 that there is concern for greenhouse gas emissions and concern over global warming. That's why we have invested $37 billion as a nation well, to understand and to address it. How much longer is the understanding period? Well, as I said, sir, we're, we have been moving forward since 2001, and we, uh, with the President's uh, directive, are taking the first steps to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from uh, new automobiles. Thank you. If I, if I might just follow up with the gentleman on one question. You can't have it both ways, uh, Mr. Johnson. You are you're touting the fact that you are starting to write regulations for tailpipe emissions, yet you have no view on whether or not the Congress should eliminate your authority to do so. Which is it? Well, I leave that decision up to Congress. Uh, and certainly, so the, it, as it, an so administration, we have not taken a position you, you, on you, that. You are saying it would be fine if the Congress removed from you no, that's the not authority. What I said. Y yes, it is. You are no, saying it is up to Congress. You don't have a view. I, you are going to sit there mute. said we have not taken a position prior. as an administration, sir. That is what I said. You are the, you are the environmental minister for the United States. There is a proposal to take away your authority to regulate CO2 coming from tailpipe emissions, you are, you are touting right now that you are starting to write regulations on it, and you are saying to us that you don't have a view on whether or not Congress should take away your authority. You are asking me to take a, a view of a specific piece of legislation which we have not taken a position on, and that's what I, that's what I keep repeating, that we have not taken a position on. Uh, there are many ways to address environmental, uh, environmental issues. Uh, and that can be done through a variety of mechanisms, whether it is through NHTSA and CAFE, uh, through EPA and the Clean Air Act, or other pieces of legislation. Your, so, si your, your, science, your silence, Mr. Johnson, is deafening because it is a silence that the entire administration has had towards these issues for the entire six and a half years that it has been in office. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Could you give us your response to the NASA report of May 30th, uh, 2007, about uh, the Earth's climate? Uh, I'm not personally familiar with that specific report. This is a report. The headline is, Research Finds That Earth's Climate Is Approaching, quote, Dangerous, close quote, point. You've read that, I assume. Well, the reports that I have read are the uh, IPCC, the International Program on uh, Climate Change. And certainly, as an administration, we have not only invested in those through money and our own scientists, but certainly we support uh, what the IPCC reports say. Well, that's impressive, but you're telling me the director of the Environmental Ministry of the United States has not read the report just a few weeks ago indicating the United States is coming to tipping points. And did you not read the conclusion of the lead author, James Hansen, who said, quote, if global emissions of carbon dioxide continue to rise at the rate of the past decade, this research shows that there will be disastrous effects, including increasingly rapid sea level rise, increased frequency of droughts and floods, and increased stress on wildlife and plants due to rapidly shifting climate zones, close quote. Now, are you telling me that you were unfamiliar with that research? What I can tell you is the yeah, pretty, uh, second IPCC question. report, if you would like me to answer the question, I would be yeah, happy to. A yes or no would be, would be handy. Well, what I am telling you is, is that, uh, according to the IPCC, extreme weather, climate and sea level impacts due to climate change are very likely. I and just so want to make sure that I understand this, and so does the American public. 
Are you telling me that the, the lead minister of the environmental uh, agency, the United States, the director of the EPA, is unfamiliar with the most recent NASA research, which indicated we are approaching a tipping point which could tip the climactic system of the world within 10 years? Are you, I just want to know, did you read that or not? Simple. I have not read that report. Thank you. I appreciate it. And your, your policies are consistent with not <laughs> reading the science coming out of the federal government. That's now, a very unfair characterization, sir. Well, I read it. There are <laughs> thousands. Well, that's good for you. Did you read the IPCC report? Yes, I have read it, actually, in quite in, in considerable detail. Let me ask you this. Uh, when, under the, under the President Bush's policies and your policies, when will, the, uh, when will we reach a tipping point which will tip us into major climactic shifts in the world? When will that occur? It is still an issue of scientific debate. And when, and according to your targets, when will the world reach doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial levels? Again, depending upon whose projections, uh, uh, I don't have a specific date, but uh, a number of scientists uh, have, have various opinions on when that might occur. And tell me this, when do you believe it should be allowed to occur? What is the target that you believe the world should have to uh, eliminate this catastrophic threat? What target should we have and what year? Well, that's precisely why the President uh, proposed at the G8 summit to bring people together to establish what that target should be and what steps then each nation should take to help achieve that target. We've been reading these reports now for over a decade. Are you telling me that the lead person for the Environmental Protection Agency cannot give us a target that the world should have to limit the amount of carbon dioxide to prevent these catastrophic effects. Is that what you're telling me? You can't oh, give me a number or a date? No, I won't give you a number. I will, I'm saying is that there are many opinions, and we think that it's important for the nations, both developed and developing nations, to get together to, uh, to identify what that goal or that target should be and then take steps at the national level. And what is the United Nations, what is the United States' position on that? What should the target be? We have not made a position yet. We're paying a lot of tax money. I've told I, you told me we've spent, I don't know, $35 billion on this, and you can't come up with the number the United States should propound? Is that what you're telling me? Where'd that uh, money go? What I'm saying is, is that uh, we have not identified a specific number. We think that that's, there's a, a lot of science that uh, leads to a wide range of numbers, and that's why we think that it's important for us to discuss it in an international context. I can tell you that my constituents are grossly embarrassed by that response, that the leading nation in the world technologically who took a man to the moon cannot establish an international target of the head of the EPA who can't give us what the target should be is grossly unsatisfactory. And it's like saying that, you know, we're going to have a meeting next year to talk about whether or not we should try to get Osama bin Laden. We should have a clear target by now in the United States of America. And I cannot for the life of me understand why you can't give us what you think should be safe for Americans on that level. And I hope someday you can do that, because we intend to create one in the United States Congress. My time has expired. Great gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Hersa Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated in my opening statement, the area I'd like to pursue with you uh, today is sort of these uh, perhaps interim regulatory steps the administration plans to take, but I would assume with the uh, uh, notion that it would inform the legislative process uh, that we are debating uh, here in Congress with regard to the dual objectives of energy independence and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one piece of the administration's 2010, 20 and 10 plan is the alternative fuel standard. It would require 35 billion gallons of alternative renewable fuels available by 2017. And I strongly supported, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the 7.5 billion gallon standard in the 2005 Energy Policy Act. So I appreciate the additional initiative from the administration. And I know in visiting directly with the President, he feels strongly about this initiative. And he doesn't want to do anything to undercut his own initiative. So I would raise with you the question I raised uh, with him and other members of his staff uh, about the issue of the particular mix of energy sources that the administration envisions in satisfying this requirement. Uh, if you could comment on that, Administrator Johnson, any conversations you've had as the agencies work together uh, 
perhaps uh, Secretary Johans has voiced uh, interest or concerns about this particular mix. And then you, uh, in your position in particular, uh, are you considering the relative greenhouse gas footprints of the fuels in that portfolio? Um, the answer is yes uh, to, your, to your last question. As part of our uh, developing our proposed regulation for addressing greenhouse gases from automobiles. There's really two ways of addressing. Well, before I get okay. to that, though, I want to talk precisely about the energy mix. And so what's yes. anticipated in the 35 billion gallon initiative? Because I do have a question for you as it relates to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And when we get to these state initiatives and what they're doing and how your agency is responding. But when you say yes, you are considering the different footprints. May I uh, inquire a further elaboration as it relates to renewable energy sources such as cellulosic ethanol versus coal to liquid uh, in meeting that 35 billion gallon target? At, uh, with, regard to the, with regard to the legislation and the 35 billion gallons, uh, the legislation was, was presented and certainly announced in the State of the Union. It was focused on two things, one, energy security, and second, uh, addressing uh, environmental concerns, particularly global climate change. Uh, in our proposal, we were, I would perhaps refer to it as technology neutral. That is that we identified a number of technologies ranging from corn ethanol to soybean biodiesel to cellulosic ethanol, as well as, as you, as you point out, coal to liquid. Uh, and so in that, uh, in our proposal, uh, we were being technology neutral. Uh, but believe that, uh, that uh, with advances in technology, both for cellulosic uh, as well as even coal to liquid, uh, that we would see improvements both in the technology being more cost effective as well as also addressing environmental concerns, particularly in the area of coal to liquid. But our experience tells us, if you look just at the renewable fuel standard of 7.5 billion gallons, and how we've structured different tax incentives, that one fuel can overwhelm another. We've seen that with ethanol versus biodiesel, which is why I propose separate standards for those fuels and carve-outs for cellulosic ethanol. Have there been any discussions uh, with your agency and others about separating out, understanding the, the, uh, what motivates the uh, technology neutral position, but how about uh, as these technologies are advancing, that we don't have, you know, the possibility of coal to liquid, which doesn't have uh, the kind of footprint uh, in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that ethanol production does, cellulosic ethanol in particular, about separating out uh, the renewable, the, the standards for which we're reaching an aggregate of 35 billion? We, we uh, in, in some of our scenarios that we ran to, to determine this ambitious goal of 35 billion gallons, we looked at a variety of combinations and we believe that certainly cellulosic ethanol plays a, a very significant role uh, in helping us, helping the nation achieve uh, 35 billion gallons. Do you believe that we can achieve 35 billion gallons with renewable fuel sources alone or do we need alternative and need coal to liquid? Well, those are those are part of the uh, part of the discussions that we need to need to have. We think uh, we think there's opportunity for all, certainly from an environmental perspective. And as we move forward on the regulation of fuel for addressing greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, certainly the carbon footprint will be a uh, an issue that we have to address. The greenhouse gas emission is something we have to address for all of the uh, for all the alternative fuels. Mr. Chairman, may I inquire one addition, if I may ask one additional follow-up question on the issue of the state initiatives. I know that um, some of the folks have been on, on California's initiative. Uh, we may be pursuing that more with the next panel. Could you provide me and the rest of the committee an update on your work with the state of Minnesota as it relates to evaluating uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles with higher blends of ethanol currently only in 10 percent ethanol blend is approved, but the Minnesota State Legislature has um, acted in a way that would in increase that blend to 20 percent ethanol. And if you could uh, address that both as it relates to uh, what you're doing with new automobiles and your regulatory authority, but also existing automobiles in the fleet, uh, those that are maybe only a decade old versus those which are pre-1995. Please do. 
Would you like me to respond now? Mr. Chairman, I, yeah, we're, we're actively working with, uh, with, the, with the state to, uh, and in fact, uh, this summer we're expecting uh, data to help, uh, help us uh, better understand the 20 percent. I mean, the, the questions <coughs> that we need to address to make sure that the 20 percent blend doesn't have a negative impact on emissions uh, or, or the equipment. And we're working with all the stakeholders, uh, including the state, as well as the automobile industry, fuel manufacturers, uh, and others, Department of Energy, and, and others to, uh, to make sure. So we're very, very much uh, interested in and reviewing and considering uh, the proposal. The lady's time has expired, and uh, we'll go uh, for a second round here. There are some other questions, I think, that has to uh, unearth before we reach the uh, second panel. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, if you are going to regulate fuels by setting an alternative fuel standard, following up on Hurst uh, Sandlin's question, if you are going to regulate fuels by setting an alternative fuel standard under Section 211 of the Clean Air Act, you have to uh, uh, have made an endangerment finding. How can you reconcile an endangerment finding with the promotion of coal to liquids, which has dramatically higher greenhouse gas emissions than renewable fuels, and have the administration be making that proposal to the Congress? Well, as part of, uh, sir, as part of, Mr. Chairman, as part of our analysis of our uh, uh, developing our proposed regulation, we'll, we will be evaluating the coal to liquid as well as other alternative fuels uh, to uh, make sure that uh, they will meet uh, what uh, we end up uh, proposing for regulating greenhouse gases from new automobiles. So that is a very important question and important consideration. Well, I think it is a conflict for the administration. First, you are saying you haven't had time to make uh, an endangerment finding, but simultaneously you are proposing a coal to liquids program for the United States. And it just seems to me that you have got a responsibility to issue your endangerment uh, finding and do so soon, given the fact that Congress is now uh, considering your coal to liquids proposal. And I, and I think that uh, there is an urgency to it. You have no time really left, and, uh, and if Congress moves forward, uh, it will be because you didn't resolve this conflict, and it is squarely on your shoulders uh, to decide whether or not this coal to liquids is something that uh, is uh, going to endanger us with additional CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you have pointed out that assuming you do move forward with a rulemaking as a result of the Supreme Court decision, you will be required to find that carbon dioxide emissions from vehicles uh, endanger public health or welfare in order to do so. Assuming that you do make that finding, is it, is it safe uh, to say that EPA would also have concluded that carbon dioxide emissions from power plants and other stationary sources pose such a danger and that emissions, therefore, also must be regulated under the Clean Air Act? Sir, the Supreme Court's decision, which, as you know, as we have been discussing, focuses on uh, motor vehicles and with regard to uh, impact on other sources under the Clean Air Act, uh, we are in the process of evaluating that now. Just to put a fine point on this, if it is a danger, if CO2 is a danger coming from tailpipes, would it not also be a danger coming from utilities or coming from industrial stationary sources. From a legal standpoint and under the, uh, under the terms under the Clean Air Act, that is one of the important questions that we are reviewing right now. A rose is a rose. CO2 is CO2, Mr. Johnson. It would really be helpful to us if you could just give us some confidence that if you find that CO2 is a problem coming out of tailpipes, that you also think it is a problem coming out of you utilities, other industrial stationary sources, not satisfactory answer. Let me turn to uh, you, Ms. Nason. Um, the Bush administration, um, uh, President Bush in his State of the Union address uh, recommended that we increase the fuel economy standards by 4 percent 
per year over the next 10 years. Let me just show you a chart, uh, Ms. Nason, because I think this can be helpful to you so you can understand why this proposal is so important and, uh, and why uh, this Massachusetts versus EPA decision and the California statute are so important. Uh, in 1977, we reached 46 percent dependence upon imported oil. It ramped up very quickly from, uh, <clears throat> from a very small percentage over a seven-year period to 46.5 percent dependency upon imported oil. But the Congress passed a law, a law saying, that the fuel economy standards for the American automotive fleet had to be doubled uh, over a 10-year period. And so while it was at 13 and a half miles per gallon in 1975, it mandated that by 1986 it be doubled to 27 miles per gallon. And you can see what happened after that law went into effect. We dropped down by 1985 and 86 to only 27 percent dependence upon imported oil. Uh, and our consumption of oil dropped, and as a result, the carbon footprint coming from our automotive sector dropped dramatically. However, then, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, until today, a 20-year period, no significant increases in fuel economy standards uh, has been promulgated. Uh, and, in fact, we have now slipped backwards from the standard we reached in 1986, uh, back from 27 back to about 25 uh, miles per gallon. And so, as a result, we are now 60 percent dependent upon imported oil. In other words, we increased from 27 percent dependence on imported oil to 60 percent dependence on imported oil in just 20 years. Now, we have 170,000 young men and women over in Iraq. Uh, 1.6 million Americans have now served over there in Iraq. 1.6 million Americans have gone over there. Uh, and, uh, and while the administration has used some justification for being over there, uh, we now realize it wasn't a nuclear weapons program. They knew for sure before the war started that there was no nuclear weapons program uh, in Iraq and that there was no Al Qaeda connection. This place as a source of oil, the Middle East as a place uh, that we, uh, in fact, receive our oil from becomes increasingly important. Um, if we increased to 35 miles per gallon, which is 4 percent per year, that actually backs out all of the oil which we import from the Persian Gulf. And so the President's proposal becomes very important. Uh, <clears throat> in the past, um, uh, while rhetorically saying the right things, we have found that on many of these environmental, environmentally related issues, um, the uh, actions have not followed. So my first question to you, Ms. Nason, is does the President want you to mandate that this 35 miles per gallon uh, standard be reached by 2017-18 uh, or 19? A mandate, Ms. Nason. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, could I just talk about the chart for one sure. second? Um, as you know, most of oil use that we bring in is gasoline. It's about 45 percent, another roughly 15 for diesel. So transportation accounts for our greatest use of oil. One of the things that we saw happen in the fleet in the 80s, again, as you know, is that the mix changed dramatically from cars to light trucks. And uh, there was a far greater percentage, it's half now, light trucks versus cars, compared to where it was in the 70s and into the early 80s. And so that did change. While we have seen greater fuel economy in cars, the increase in the fleet of light trucks, uh, you know, SUVs as cars for people, did have an impact on overall fuel economy, as I know you know. And the President's proposal, the 8.5 billion gallons that he talked about in the State of the Union, and the really only way to get there is to do roughly a 4 percent increase in CAFE year over year 
to 2017, which is the 20 and 10 proposal, does not contain 4% in writing, as we've discussed. It is a goal. It is a target. It is something that we take, obviously, very seriously, and we would work very hard to meet, but it is not something that we have put in writing in the statute, because the President has also said that he'd like to see us do a full, comprehensive rulemaking, weigh all of the factors that we need to weigh, and that our target should be 4 percent, but uh, we didn't put it in writing in the 20 and 10 proposal. Yes, that's the problem. And the problem be is that um, the administration has yet to say anything about the proposal which is before the Congress right now, um, that in draft form, which calls for an increase of only 1.7 percent per year through the year 2022. So um, would this administration oppose, would you oppose any legislation uh, which uh, will undermine your goal of 4 percent? In other words, will this administration oppose language which sets a goal not of 4 percent but of only 1.7 percent? I think the best answer I can give you at the moment, Mr. Chairman, is that, uh, as we have said, we really would like to work with the Congress to get the authority to reform the program. I think the place we do have agreement, I have looked at your legislation and others, uh, is on reforming the program. I think where we have disagreement is on stringency levels. I, I hope See, here is the problem with the President um, and with your agency, Ms. Nason. Um, what, what he wants to be able to say in the State of the Union is that this is a goal which is achievable for our country. It is critical for the national security of our country. But he is not willing to mandate it. Uh, and, in fact, if Congress wants to cut his goal in half, uh, which is what it is now saying, this administration won't say anything about it, has no recommendation on it. And, and, and so we wind up with the administration setting a goal, but it is not mandated, having Congress propose something, some key Congress people propose that they cut the goal in half, have the administration say nothing about it, uh, and then we are supposed to believe that this administration cares about, one, this huge importation of oil from OPEC, and this rising concern about global warming. Uh, and it doesn't square, Ms. Nason. The actions of the President do not square up with the promise uh, that he has made to the American people uh, on these issues. Let me ask one other question. Uh, Mr. Johnson uh, has been given authority under EPA versus Massachusetts to regulate CO2. Uh, the legislation which is now pending before the Energy Committee would strip Mr. Johnson of his ability uh, to regulate and strip his ability to give to the States their ability to regulate. Um, do you support that legislation? Do you believe that the uh, EPA is not a proper place to have jurisdiction over uh, this issue? Well, I think we are working very well together, as the President directed, for 20 and 10. If you are asking what I do support, I support 20 and 10. That is the President's no, proposal. I am asking now about this very critical jurisdictional issue, which is at the heart of this hearing and the heart of the legislative debate which we are having uh, right now in uh, this city. Do you support um, this legislation which would strip the authority from EPA and, the, and repose it exclusively in your own agency? The draft committee report? That's correct. I think as Mr. Johnson has, as the administrator has made clear, sir, we don't have an official administration position on uh, the draft legislation or many of the other bills that we see going through the House and Senate, but we do look forward to working with you to try to get uh, legislation through this Congress. Is, your, is, the, is the goal of your agency, the mandate of your agency, to look after the health of our country? No, sir. It is not, is it? No. No. Uh, Mr. Johnson's agency has the responsibility to look after the health of our country. If CO2 is found to be a pollutant and it is something which is endangering the health or welfare of our country, he has a responsibility to do something about it. Uh, you, on the other hand, have a responsibility to increase the fuel economy of our vehicles while ensuring that safety is maintained. 
That's a different responsibility. Do you have a problem with Mr. Johnson having the authority to be able to protect the health of our country? I have no problem with the administrator. <laughs> well, I'm talking about him having the authority to uh, protect the health and welfare of our country. Do you have a problem with that, Ms. Nason? With health and welfare, no, sir. No. So, so. Out on a limb. <laughs> no, I have no problem. With well, there is there are there is language in the draft bill which we are now going to be considering next week in Congress, which would strip Mr. Johnson of his ability to uh, deal with that issue. So that's a problem, and it's something that uh, obviously concerns this panel uh, greatly. And I would hope that it would concern the president, although I'm not um, really assured that he has drawn his attention to it. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, if he has any Mr. questions. Chairman, I, I do he has a plane to catch. Okay, <laughs> let, me recognize, let me recognize the gentleman from, uh, from uh, Washington State. Uh, thank you. The world is rapidly reaching a consensus that we have to stop CO2 from going beyond a doubling of CO2 and from pre-industrial levels, and eventually even your administration will reach that conclusion, I'm confident. But your administration continues to insist that we can cut our emissions of CO2 in half or more, which we have to do to reach that target, by voluntary mechanisms. That somehow, if the President just asks American industrial leaders to cut their CO2, sends them a nice letter on nice stationery, that they'll just voluntarily cut their CO2. But when your administration wants to test our kids and no child left behind, not a voluntary program, don't get to make that decision. We require our kids to perform. Why does your administration require fifth graders to perform but expects voluntary decisions by CEOs of the largest corporations in the world to sort of volunteer to solve this problem? Let me first, uh, first comment that, again, uh, we have a wide array of partnership programs that are delivering results. In addition, as we've been talking about, we're in the process of writing regulations, mandatory regulations to control greenhouse gases from new automobiles. So it is what our overall approach is, includes an array of partnership programs, and includes now this mandatory program of addressing greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. But your proposal will specifically reject what the rest of the industrialized world has embraced, at least in European Union, a cap-and-trade system to have a mandatory enforceable cap on CO2. You have rejected a renewable portfolio standard, which will give Americans the guarantee they will have renewable clean energy. You have rejected meaningful enforceable standards for green building requirements. You have rejected virtually every significant thing other than baby steps at big, at, at most. Isn't that correct? That's not correct. Well, are you going to embrace the cap and trade system? This is news uh, to me. Let the let the let's, uh, let's start, blow here. Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's start with the list. Uh, we have not rejected a renewable fuel portfolio standard. In fact, it wasn't that many weeks ago that I signed the final final regulation imposing the 7.5 billion gallon requirement on the United States. So, are you suggesting and, to and we are as part of our regulation? of deal, dealing with automobile greenhouse gas emissions, there are only two ways. There's no special catalytic converter that you can put on an automobile or a light truck to address greenhouse gas emissions. Are you embracing There's two ways. There's one to address the fuel and to address the engine efficiency. Sir, I, I don't have a lot of time and there is a plane. Um, are you suggesting to Congress that we adopt a renewable portfolio standard to give Americans the assurance we'll have a certain degree of electricity from clean renewable energy sources? I, I believe that we should be working together to achieve uh, our energy security goals and environmental Will goals. Will the President sign a bill that has a renewable portfolio standard in it? Well, I look forward to working with you to address that issue. Will the President sign a bill that has a cap and trade system in it? No. That's unfortunate. And I think you're premature, and I hope you are. Because the world is looking for America to reclaim leadership, the country that established democracy, the country that put a man on the moon, 
to have the White House stand in the schoolhouse door of the most effective thing we can do to preserve the environment for our kids. And I hope you haven't checked with the President. I hope you're not authorized to say that. Because if we're going to have a meaningful dialogue with the White House, they've got to keep that door open. Because it is the single most effective thing that we can do for our grandkids. And I hope that you go back and check with the White House again and said, you know, maybe I spoke a little too soon in answering that question. Because I heard the President say he wants to turn over new leaf, sort of, in Europe the other day. And I hope that happens for my grandkids and yours. So I just hope you have that conversation. I got one other question. Maybe I don't. <laughs> I think uh, you've made enough points. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I think he made his point. The gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, to shift. I will be very brief. I just have two additional follow-ups. Um, uh, I'm, I'm listening to uh, Mr. Johnson, your rhetoric about uh, the uh, commitment and the progress that is being made. I believe I read a GAO report that you have missed 34 consecutive deadlines for upgrading fu appliance efficiency standards. This administration has missed 34 consecutive deadlines for appliance efficiency. Well, we have been working uh, effectively with the uh, Department of Energy to uh, help uh, establish efficiency standards, and there are some technical issues. Has uh, this administration up. missed 34 consecutive deadlines for increasing appliance efficiency standards? I would have to get back to you for the record, sir. In the ballpark? Is that in the GAO in the ballpark? Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the GAO report uh, on the specifics. Some of the smart people behind you know if well, it's if <laughs> DOE it's, has the responsibility for prom promulgating is what uh, my note says. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to punt. Uh, I just uh, I would just respectfully suggest that actions do speak louder than words, and the failure of this administration to meet 34 consecutive deadlines for increasing appliance efficiency speaks volumes about the commitment of things that would actually make a difference, a sense of urgency. Um, and it is another reason why I am, um, uh, it is hard to take what you are saying at face value when little, tiny steps that are already established in law this administration can't figure out how to do. I could understand one out of ten maybe two out of ten, you know, batting only 400, you know, but 0 for 34 strikes me that you and the administration aren't serious. Which leads me to my other question in advance of hearing from Attorney General uh, Brown and others in the, who, uh, we have, as I understand, you have not yet announced a timeline for making a final decision on the waiver request. Is that true? That is correct. Can you give us some hint of what the timeline is going to be? You have been sitting on this now doing whatever you are doing for uh, 10 weeks since the decision. It has been bubbling since 2005. Do people have to sue again to get a, a deadline? Well, I, as I mentioned, we are expeditiously and responsibly following the statutory process, which requires a hearing. The State of California that. I don't asked want you to have for to re repeat what you already said. For, That's why I asked: Do you have a deadline well, that I, these people can count on? Is it going I to be have, in three weeks, three months? What I have said to the State of California and others is that I want to wait until the close of the comment period, which is next Friday, have an opportunity to assess the nature of the comments, and then we'll make a specific decision as to the timing of when we will make a decision. Thank you. I thank the, uh, the gentleman very much. And I would note that I am the author of the 1987 appliance efficiency law that the administration has missed all 34 deadlines in six years in applying and in, in imposing uh, higher standards for efficiency for all of those uh, 
prices which we use in our country. And of course, because they missed all 34 deadlines over six and a half years, dozens of new coal-fired plants have, have to be built to generate the electricity for the less efficient appliances which we use in our country, contributing, endangering uh, our atmosphere with those additional emissions for refrigerators or stoves or whatever that could have been much more efficient. Let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, and, and those coal plants um, are producing about 520,000 tons of uh, nitrogen oxide, uh, which is, is uh, polluting the atmosphere equal to about 500,000 automobiles. But I want to return to the lawsuit. <clears throat> uh, the Supreme Court case, I'm sorry. Um, you argued, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, that the regulation of, of uh, CO2s would require the regulation of fuel economy standards, uh, which the, uh, you stated is the ju jurisdiction of Ms. Nason. Um, but the Supreme Court then responded uh, by saying that uh, it recognized that the multi-agency efforts were needed uh, to address certain issues. And then the court stated, and I quote, the fact that the DOT's mandate to promote energy efficiency by setting mild standards may overlap with the EPA's environmental responsibilities in no way licenses EPA to shirk its duty to protect the public health and welfare, unquote. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to ask both of you, actually, uh, recognizing the uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, is there now ongoing work between the two agencies uh, since the co court decision, and what direction is it going if, in fact, there has been uh, a response to the, the Supreme Court's uh, directive? Uh, the uh, one word answer is yes. We are working together post the Supreme Court uh, decision. I'm sorry. I said yes. We are working together uh, post the Supreme Court decision, and it's uh, following what the president's uh, executive order directing us to do, and that is to work together to develop a regulation that will regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new automobiles. Did that? I mean, were you working together prior to the to the Supreme Court's decision? We, on this? Uh, well, we work very closely together because uh, one of EPA's uh, roles and responsibilities as part of uh, fuel economy uh, is to calculate fuel economy. That's the, the window sticker in the windows. And as I'm sure you're probably well aware, I issued a rule last December which actually significantly improves uh, that window sticker for the 2008 model year. And we work together in the CAFE program. We do tests. The automobile industry does tests, emission tests. We share that uh, information with our colleagues uh, at NHTSA and Department of Transportation to enable them to well, monitor my, and calculate CAFE. So we have a long-standing relationship together. Thank you. My, my, uh, the reason I raise the question is the, the, the fact that your attorneys uh, suggested that, um, that it was the DOT's responsibility, I mean, the, uh, arguing before the Supreme Court, which would also suggest that there was not prior uh, work together. Well, we've been working together for, for years well, uh, why would on the, the issue of, of uh, air pollutants and uh, engine efficiency as well as fuels. Well, why would, the, why would, the, so. the, why would your attorneys argue that it was the, the DOT's responsibility? My, uh, my recollection uh, is that uh, it was I mean, because, I have it right here. Okay. Well, it was my, my recollection because of the CAFE, because Department of Transportation is responsible for the CAFE standard, not EPA. Ms. Ms. Nason, is that, is that uh, yes, your understanding? Yes, Congressman. I think there was concern about um, not having overlapping regulations. And as you just said, the, the Supreme Court's word there was overlap. Yes, there may be overlap in the obligations now, but we are certain that the agencies can work together to Seamlessly. resolve it. Seamlessly. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> we I, are. We can enforce CAFE 
<laughs> without the help of the EPA even before this. So that's what we're working together to do. That was the president's directive in May 14th. Um, well, I'm glad this is being televised because I think the people around the nation are weeping with joy because two <laughs> federal agencies are working together, holding hands, <laughs> walking under the great <laughs> moonlight. Uh, let me, <laughs> my final question uh, relates to uh, deforestation uh, station. Um, scientists have, con of course, if we don't agree that the scientists, um, <laughs> some dumb scientists have c c concluded that, um, that the loss of natural forest uh, around the world contributes more uh, to global emissions each year than the transport sector. And so um, if that is, do, do you agree with that, Mr. Johnson? Before well, I we don't, uh, EPA does not have responsibility for uh, our, the forests of our nation or I understand global forests, that. but uh, certainly uh, uh, from an administration perspective, uh, we are concerned about uh, global deforestation and uh, believe that across the, across the globe, steps need to be taken to avoid uh, deforestation. That's the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions, Do, don't you agree? It is a, it is a, it is a way of, uh, it's one of the tools in the toolbox, yes. I'm, okay, I'm trying, I don't know of anything that's more cost-effective than just saying that we're not going to uh, cut down a tree. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just wondering what, what international uh, effort is underway, or is there any dialogue going on on this subject uh, in terms of the, the deforestation of the, uh, uh, around the globe? Uh, I would, uh, if, if I could, sir, uh, get back to the record for the record for you. Uh, as I said, it's not uh, EPA's responsibility, but uh, certainly be happy to uh, uh, have uh, our colleagues at our, I know that our State Department and others are uh, intimately involved in helping to address this issue, and we'll, we'll have a response back to you. Thank you. Uh, it, it is my hope that, uh, I mean, there's been a, a, a lot said over the last uh, week or so from the administration, and, and it is my hope that at, uh, at, at, at some point there will be more done than said. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quickly, a uh, follow-up observation from the comments and questions from Mr. Inslee and Mr. Blumenauer, and then just a follow-up question for you, Administrator Johnson, uh, along the lines that I was pursuing earlier. When we were in um, Brussels a couple of weeks ago uh, with Speaker Pelosi, uh, I raised the issue with President Barroso about an interim target that the European Union had set for renewable fuel usage for 2005 and the fact that they missed that target. And I asked uh, President Barroso and others in the room what the reasons were for missing that target. And the explanation was the fact that it was voluntary and no one took it seriously. And given our own experience with a mandatory cap and trade for sulfur dioxide emissions, given our own experience that President Bush seems to have acknowledged with a mandatory 7.5 billion gallon renewable fuel standard that has now led to his initiative of a 35 billion alternative fuel standard, I do hope, as Mr. Inslee stated, that that indicates some willingness of President Bush to work with us as we move forward to recognize the importance of uh, mandatory uh, policies that reach the objectives and the importance of making them mandatory uh, to meet the, the objectives, whether it is greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, and, our, again, our own experience here in the United States with a cap and trade system, as well as with these fuels, alternative fuel mandates. Uh, my follow-up question uh, for you on the uh, Minnesota studies that are going mm -hmm. on. I know you had mentioned that we would be getting data sometime this summer, but does the EPA have any sort of timeline or deadline for then uh, assessing that data and making a decision about whether or not to approve something other than uh, a 10 percent blend of ethanol with gasoline? Uh, we don't because part of the reason we don't know when the data are going to come in or what the nature and extent of the data are. As I said, we're we're uh, we're working very cooperatively with the, with the state and others to uh, to help address the issue. Um, but the, uh, some of the data will be available this summer. Yes, 
but I, again, I don't know what will be or won't be, and will it be sufficient to be able to make a determination? Again, we're, we're operating in an open and a transparent way to address the issues of, again, emissions as well as uh, the engine and, and whether, in fact, uh, it can accommodate uh, a higher, higher blend of ethanol. Um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our hope is, is that the, uh, the engineering and all the, the answers will, will uh, uh, point us in the direction of the ability to do higher blends. We certainly support E85, for example, uh, because it has uh, it's good for the economy. It's good it's good uh, from an energy security standpoint, and it also has a better environmental profile. So, well, I agree with you on all that. <laughs> but uh, given that we're still struggling to get E85 pumps available across the country, we've got to deal with the existing domestic fleet as Detroit manufactures more flex fuel vehicles and many of us believe that the data will support uh, that the existing domestic fleet can take something uh, higher than an E10 blend and so I would appreciate it if you could keep uh, this committee as well as uh, uh, the committees of jurisdiction I know are similarly interested uh, in this issue apprised once the data comes in this summer so that we can also evaluate uh, what the initial studies and analysis looks like. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will be pleased to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And let me, Ms. Nason, let me just do one final line of question. Um, the four of us who are here, uh, along with Speaker Pelosi, uh, visited first Greenland. 10 days ago, uh, observe this incredible phenomenon which is occurring, uh, rapidly intensifying pace of melt uh, movement uh, of the ice cap and glaciers and icebergs that, uh, uh, if it ever happened, would lead to a 20-foot rise in the sea levels of the world. Frightening experience. I recommend to you, Mr. Johnson, that you go to it and that you see what's happening in Greenland. To you as well, Ms. Nason, so that you can understand fully the danger, not just to those that live in Greenland, but to those who live in the United States, those who live in Florida, those who live in the coastlines of our country. If this phenomenon ever did occur, and if we're going to stop it, we have to start now. If we're going to protect people from something that happened 50 and 100 years from now, we have to start now. And by the way, 70 percent of all people who will be alive uh, in uh, 70 percent of the people alive today will be alive in the year 2050. We're not doing it, but some theoretical group of people, 70 percent of all people living today. We have a responsibility to protect them. Now, in Europe, what we found was that uh, they're going. They're mandating in Europe a 43.4 miles per gallon standard by the year 2012, Ms. Nason. They're already at 35 miles per gallon. You're telling us today that you can't commit to a 35 mile per gallon standard 10 years from now. That you can't commit that it will be mandatory. And yet the Europeans are going to meet a 43.4 mile per gallon standard by 2012, only five years from now. And not only BMW and Daimler Chrysler and Volkswagen, but Ford and General Motors have said they will meet the European standard. And Ford and General Motors are the leading automotive com companies in terms of sales in Europe. Why, Ms. Nason, can't we meet that standard? Why can't we at least say we will do 10 years from now what the EU is doing today? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was in Germany last November and then in Japan last week, and I am going to Brussels next week to meet with essentially the NHTSA counterpart woman over there. Uh, they had had voluntary standards in place, which my understanding was the manufacturers had all said they couldn't possibly meet. And this was some of the difficulties that they were having. In Germany, they were saying they couldn't meet the European standards. And we had some very, I think, interesting discussions with the Japanese government about uh, their cafe and how they would like to, to see changes. Um, 
I, I haven't seen Ford or GM say that they could meet 43 miles a gallon. That would be oh, very no, they, interesting. They have, I, I talked to the American Chamber of Commerce in Europe, and they said they're meeting the standard. Matter of fact, every American company that does business uh, in Europe has signed off on and said they will meet the goals that the EU is setting for a cap and trade system for emissions across all industries as well. That all the American companies doing business over there, which are all of our biggest companies, will meet that European standard. They have different, as you know, they certainly have a different fuel mix, fleet mix in Europe. Um, I think half the fleet in Europe is diesels, and most of those diesels wouldn't meet the clean diesel requirements in the United States. So there are alternative ways that they could meet a standard that they might not be able to meet in the United States. At, you know, there's far greater penetration of diesels in the marketplace in Europe, and I think that they are looking to bring clean diesels to the United States. I've seen. Chrysler, for example, is looking to make them their Jeep line diesels, um, barring perhaps on what Daimler had been doing in Europe with the Mercedes diesel. So I do think that technology is going to make the difference in how they can meet the standards in the U.S. I'm not, I'm not, we're not looking for us to take on a task that's impossible. Let me just ask you one final question. The Ford Escape. SUV, hybrid, gets 36 miles per gallon. Is the Ford Escape SUV hybrid less safe than the Ford Escape SUV? No, sir. No. It's the same safety, but with 40 percent higher mileage. So we are not really asking for you, Ms. Nason, to take on this responsibility. Um, to ask our automotive industry to do something that is impossible. It is something that they are already doing. We are asking you to set this goal for 2017 or 2018 that can meet that national challenge. Um, and, uh, and it is critical that you do it. We didn't hear the right answers today with regard to it being mandated or it being 35 miles per gallon. What we have heard here today is that initiatives to reduce carbon emissions, such as tailpipe standards, or even fuel economy standards are being stalled, while initiatives that increase carbon emissions, such as coal to liquids, are being encouraged. I suggest that President Bush is in danger of cementing his place in history as an environmental Emperor Nero, a man who fiddled as civilization burned down around him. And it is very important that this administration under the threat that this planet. Thank both of you for your testimony here today. Uh, we will uh, be working in close conjunction with you for the next year and a half. Speaker Pelosi has made it quite clear that she wants to see a dramatic reduction in imported oil and it also wants a mandatory cap and trade system. Uh, Pass the United States Congress and to be placed upon the desk of the President. That is going to require the two of you sitting here to be the central players in accomplishing these goals. So we hope that uh, and we know that this will be the first of many visits that you have back before the select. Thank you. And now we will move to our second panel. Uh, <clears throat> our second panel um, is uh, here in order to uh, ensure uh, that we uh, get to uh, the heart of the uh, uh, matter in uh, Massachusetts versus uh, EPA and the California uh, statute. Here for uh, 